and we want to give a shout out to our YouTube family. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. We started a new series on forgiveness and we called it or calling it a heart that forgives. You know, the Bible says, Jesus said, if you do not from your heart forgive every man of their trespasses, their failings, their shortcomings, he said, I cannot forgive you. So forgiving others is a command by God. It's not a feeling. Well, I don't feel like it. Well, then you just made a choice right? Because the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, that God is love. And he who dwells in love dwells in God. A step out of love is a step out of God. See, God is love. God is a person who loves. We are the people of God. We choose to love one another and forgive one another, or we make the simple choice that we don't want to do it. And how many know, we uh, started off, one of our text scriptures we started off was Mark 11, 24, when Jesus spoke to a fig tree, and Jesus cursed it. He said, no man will ever eat fruit of you again. 24 hours later, Peter noticed the fig tree, he said to Jesus, Master, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. And he said, Have the faith of God, and that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he say shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he said. Then Jesus says something that's connecting to you speaking and receiving. This is, this is connected. He said, now, while you're trying to get that mountain, a mountain represents, uh, mountains are big. It's no coincidence that he said mountain. He used a mountain in the illustration because mountains represent, they're big, so they represent big problems, right? And, and, and mountains are permanent right? Maybe you're facing a situation that seems that is permanent. They said no, but God said you can speak to it and you can change it with your mouth. But while you're speaking to that big situation, that difficulty, Jesus said, while you're trying to move that mountain, that situation, while you're trying to get that sickness, that disease to leave you, he said, if you have anything against anybody, he said, by the way, forgive them so that your Father in heaven will forgive you. We learned in uh, Psalm 66, 18, the psalmist said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the word iniquity means sin of any kind. If I regard iniquity, regard means you become aware of sin and you harbor that malice, that unforgiveness, which will eventually turn to malice and hatred if we don't get rid of it, he said, God will not listen to you. So when you stand praying, if you have anything against anybody, forgive them so that when you speak to that mountain, when you speak to that problem, when you speak to that um, situation that seems like it won't budge, if, you, if your heart is clean, your, hand, your heart is pure, your hands are clean, that situation has to obey you. Because everything that God created is subject to man's dominion and man's authority. Say everything. everything. In Genesis chapter 3, I believe, maybe verse 26, God said this. He said, well, when he made man on the sixth, on the sixth day he said uh, and let us make man in our image and our likeness and let us give them dominion over all the works of our hands so man and in, in the book of psalms it says that you were made a little lower than god now in the king james they translated that as you were made a little lower than the angels uh -uh. you were made a, just a hair that word angel should have been translated elohim say god you were made a little lower than God Almighty. I got a revelation that I am a speaking spirit, that when I speak to a mountain, it has to obey me. Amen. Amen. There's been times in my life where I had to speak more than once. Why? Because I wasn't convinced that it was going to obey me. But, you know, you may, have to, you, may, you may have to speak to it more than one time. 
Because the Bible says that if you, when you speak to it, when you believe in your heart, believe in, in, and if you believe in your heart and doubt not, you shall have whatsoever you say it. There's been times where I didn't believe it and I had to keep speaking it until I did believe it. Because yeah. faith comes by hearing. The lady with the issue of blood, she bled for 12 long years. How many know she was weak? She was feeble. And she kept saying, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. She kept saying it. And finally, she convinced herself and she did something about it. She pressed through the crowd. She touched the hem of his garment and she was made whole. The Bible says instantly she was made whole. Instantly she received her miracle. It can happen in an instant. Amen. Maybe saying it one more time is the key to you, to your breakthrough, to you being delivered. Amen. Say one more time. One more Say, time. I'm going to keep saying it. Hebrews 10, 23. And let us hold fast to the confession of our faith without wavering, for God is faithful that promise. Confession means say the same thing. Amen. You keep saying it until you get it in your heart. And I'm tell Kenneth Hagan, uh, born with an incurable blood disease, deformed heart. Now he's 17 years old. He's paralyzed from his waist down, I believe. Yeah, from his waist down. He kept reading Mark 11, 24, whosoever shall say to the mountain. And, um, and he'll have whatsoever he say. He say, I read that scripture every day for one year. He's 17. He never heard anything that you can talk to situations and they obey you. He said it one more time. And God said, people, he said it was one o'clock in the afternoon. And he, he was reading it and said it one more time. And the Holy Ghost said, you know, people that are healed shouldn't be in bed this time of the day. He said he got up. Now, remember, he had... um. Uh, develop his upper body books or whatever he had and he was strong and that's how God gave him an unction to develop his upper body he said he, he thought he was just doing it just to pass time away and he's up there doing books or whatever he had developing his upper body and he said it was a pole by his bed he said I, with everything in me I mustered up enough strength he said I push my legs out on the bed while I'm holding on he, he pushed his legs out on the side of the bed he grabbed hold of that pole he said and with all my might I pulled my body up and he say folks it's like electricity went through my body he say it hurt so bad but it felt so good because he was paralyzed for over a year Amen. mark 11 24 you can speak to that mountain you can speak to that seemingly big situation that seems like it will not move it will not obey you but you keep speaking to it Amen. and believe in your heart that's when it's gonna move when you believe in your heart if you doubt not in your heart, but believe what you say, it will come to pass. You're going to have what you say it, not what the doctor said, not what the devil said. You're going to have what you say it. Amen. 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 And, and of course, what we're saying is what the word of God is saying. Amen. And we know that God's word that goes forth out of our mouth will not return to us void, but it will accomplish. There too we send it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Don't you love Charles Camps? Oh yes. I think, I think he's the best faith, uh, faith teacher that ever graced this earth during my generation. That's what I believe. The man is phenomenal. I mean, just just amazing. The revelation knowledge that he had. Amen. Say, I can have what I say, I can have but I better watch what I say. Now, what we're going to talk about a heart that forgives. Say, I choose to forgive, choose to forgive so, that so that I can be forgiven. Ephesians 4.32, be tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has also forgiven you. You can't sow unforgiveness and expect for God to forgive you. It's not going to work. Amen. I say it's not going to work. Amen. Now we're going to move on. <clears throat> Introduce new scripture. How to settle the account of unforgiveness. What should you do? It's up there. Open book test. I mean, you have got to forgive quickly. How soon? Quickly. If you, Wait a minute. If you want to be forgiven quickly. How many has ever goofed up and you wanted God to forgive you right then? Okay, I got three of you. With me, that's four. Okay, I got five. Okay. All right. And how to settle the account of forgiveness. I got forgive quickly. Paul the Apostle said this. He said, I forget those things 
which are behind me. You got to bury the past, so the ba you got to bury the past, for the past buries you. Isn't that right? Paul said, but one thing I count on myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, I forget in those things which are behind me and reaching forward to those things which are before me. Now, this is what, this is what you're going to have to do if you're struggling with this unforgiveness. Verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. How many know you're going to have to press through that? Amen. If you want to enter the high calling of God, you can't let the baggage of unforgiveness stop you from entering your high calling because it will stop you. Amen. Say, I'm going to bury the past bury before it past. buries me. Bury how about not just you, but how about bury the past when it's pertaining to somebody else? I didn't say you had to be around them. I got to keep saying that. You don't have to be around them, but you got to forgive them. Say amen. amen. How about make restitution? How to settle the account of unforgiveness? We're talking about, we're still talking about uh, if you have ought against another person. Make restitution if possible. Say if possible. If possible. Like, what can I do to make this right? And I wrote down today when I was reading my notes, if you're led by the Holy Ghost to do that. God may tell you, drop it, leave it alone. Amen. I've had him, he say, say nothing. He, one time he said, more than many times he say, say nothing, don't apologize, just confess it to me and move on. You got to listen to God, amen? amen? Make restitution if possible. Now, you know, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. The Bible calls him a publican. A publican was considered a notorious sinner. Zacchaeus collected more taxes than what was due. So he was a rich thief. Say a rich thief. A rich thief. And the Bible says he was short of stature. And he knew that Jesus was coming to his hometown, Jericho. And he thought, I heard about him. I want to see him. Real short man. So he climbed up a sycamore tree because he wanted to just see Jesus as he passed by. And Jesus had a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge is something, it, it is, is a spoken, it's something spoken of, a, it's a current event that God give you knowledge of. You had no idea, but God told you something about somebody. It's something, it's a current event that's happening in their life at that particular time. And Jesus turned around a word of knowledge. He said, Zacchaeus, come down for today. I must abide at your house. So Zacchaeus came down, and as Jesus was sitting at the table across from him, the Bible doesn't record he said anything. And Zacchaeus, I mean, you know what? I guarantee you he felt the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. And out of nowhere, he said, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And it's a conjunction. And if I've taken anything by false accusation, he said, I'll restore it. Four times, fourfold. That was the price of a sheep stealer. You stole one sheep, you're going to give back four. So Zacchaeus was convicted and he was willing to make restitution. Y'all get that? He did something that the, and you, you, you know what Jesus said to him? He said, You are truly a son of Abraham. He basically repented right there. He did something that the rich young ruler could not do. The rich young ruler, he didn't let go of anything. Wow. And Zacchaeus, he said, half of my goods. All right, his wealth, let's split it in half. So he's left with the other 50%. He said, half of my goods I give to the poor. And, and in addition to that, and if I've taken anything by false accusation, he said, I'll restore it fourfold. So his net worth would have been this. Zero. He was willing to make restitution. Why? He had offended a lot of people. He stole their money. Ever been stolen from before? I'll leave that alone. Okay. Nah, I didn't leave that alone. How about King David? How to settle the account of unforgiveness. If you have offended somebody else. The Bible says leave your gift at the altar. Matthew 5, 23, go be reconciled to your brother and then come back, bring your gift. He is not talking about your tithes and offerings. He is talking about your prayer requests. In other words, he is not going to listen to you. 
if you have anything against anybody. Now, I didn't say that you weren't working on it. There's been times, like, I told you I lived with that cousin for three years. Ooh, I hated her sinking guts. I'm just saying. It was one thing after another. Remember, I just told you a little brief history of it. We get to Washington State. Didn't tell her BFF, her best friend, that she had uh, three or four house dogs, two dogs outside. She go, what? And she's bringing them in. She go, who dogs are these? These are mine. She said, well, you didn't tell me that you had any dogs. She said, well, you know I had them when I left. She said, but you, I didn't know you still had them. Can you imagine me? I'm sitting there like, oh, my God, we ain't going to have nowhere to stay. Sure enough, she said, you can't stay here. I'm like, oh, no. You know, you know my mama, uh, back then she was rich. I could have called my mama. Mom, give me a plane ticket. I'm, out, I'm getting out of here. Elvis has left the building. I'm coming home. But I didn't do it. Oh, my God. We go to somebody else's house. They stole all my new church dresses because oh the daughter was a drug addict because I wouldn't give her $50. I'm like, ooh, ooh. This stuff is crazy. I won't tell y'all, three years of this, I had to, before I left, that's when I completely forgave her. I, I struggled with it. I, I said, God, I just want you to know, I think I, I, I think I really do hate her guts. You know, it was one thing after another. It was unbelievable. One time, I was 22 then, she talked me into not tithing. She gone, well, this is preacher. I ain't even going to say his name. Well, this preacher said, God don't mind if you take, if you take your tithes and pay your, your bill money. I was 22. I had. To, I said, well, I've never read that. Where is that in the Bible? She couldn't tell me. But he said it. I said, I don't care what he said. If you can't give me a scripture, I'm not doing it. Oh, I mean, she kept putting all that pressure on me. Well, we got to eat. I'm you know, looking at her. You didn't eat. You should have fast. But anyway, <laughs> I know. Bad. Bad. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, and so I'm telling you, I've been in situations. I put myself in a situation. Getting out the will of God. And I had to work on that. And God was answering my prayers. You know why? Because I was willing to forgive her, but I struggle with him. You understand? I'm not saying that you, some, some things people do to you. And I'm, I, I use Joyce Meyer as an example, because she talks about it all the time. She struggled with it for years. And she said, God's going to make sure that I'm going to forgive my parents. She said, I took care of my parents to the day they took their last breath. Can you imagine that? And she moved him on the same property with her. And we call it a mother-in-law quarters, two big old nice houses. She go, what? And she say, no. Then she said, that's what you're going to do. And she did it. She's a woman who made a decision to forgive. She struggled with it. But, I mean, she overcame it. Amen. And you can, too. Amen. And I know sometimes you think, how can somebody do somebody else like that? I'm thinking about my cousin, girl. How can you do, do your best friend like that? And ta-da, I'm here. <laughs> it, was, it was terrible. How can you invade somebody's house with, uh, let me see, I think it was three or four house dogs. Three or four. And, two, and you're going to put two, two dogs outside of that woman. That is crazy. Huh. God is good, isn't it? But that multiplied to 19 dogs, seven cats. All right. <laughs> Woo! I told you one time that I went to Barbara's eye when I was younger and um, I like to wear my hair slick back my makeup face all painted you know went to church one time this uh, friend of mine she said I've been wanting to talk to you I want to tell you something's really important I go what is that and I'm just smiling yeah looking good on the outside and she said do, do y'all do you have a lot of dogs I say yeah she said Every time I smell you, not, she said, when you got your coat on, I can't smell nothing because it went on my clothes because you wash those, but the coat, you don't send that to the cleaners every week. She said, um, your coat smells just like a dog. My heart went, I mean, it's just dropped. But I was so happy she told me that. Isn't God good? Yeah. You know, I, you, you know, I mean, you know, the dog, let the dog get on you. Hey, cutie, and you they all on your coat when you first come in. I mean, looking like a model, but smelling like a dog. I mean, wow, it was deep. So, I mean, it's just a lot of stuff that I had to forgive, and I did it. I did it. I'm free. Praise God. Amen. And then years down the road, no, several months down the road, I was home. I was sitting on the side of bed, and God gave me, I think it's in Galatians 5.1. It says, stand fast in the liberty, the freedom, wherewith 
Christ has made you free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. I thought, oh, okay. I thought, you know, I always think, I wonder what's this about. Didn't think nothing about it. Huh? I, I, I don't even think it was a hot minute. The, my, my cell phone rang and it was her. I went, hi. She said, girl, let me tell you something. I was praying. Uh -oh. Now, I take that back. I had been home close to a year because I lived with my dad. She said, girl, I was praying. The Lord told me, you better get yourself on back here. I said, you know what's so funny? I said, God just gave me uh, Galatians 5, 1, and I quoted it. Are you saying you were in bondage with me? Well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> about King David? King David offended God and Bathsheba. He committed adultery. He was, she was forced to do it. You know, uh, when the king summons for her, if she had not gone, do you know he could have had her executed or whatever? Yeah. She went and um, he committed adultery. It resulted in her pregnancy, Bathsheba. And then to cover it up, what did he do? He murdered her husband. Oh my God. Yeah, right. That was the straw that broke the camel's back. And God's mercy kicked in. Because God knew that David loved him, but his flesh was out of control. God sent Nathan the prophet to confront him. And after he told him about this, uh, this traveler and this one little lamb, this rich man took this uh, poor man's lamb. David go, he was angry. He go, this man should die. He didn't know he was talking about himself. This man should die and restore and restore the lamb fourfold. Well, only one problem with that, Uriah was already dead. You know what I'm saying? So David, David couldn't make restitution. That's my point. Sometimes you can't make restitution. It is what it is. It's kind of like um, you can't unscramble eggs, right? <laughs> And what do you call it? A three hole? What do you call it? If you shred paper, I guarantee you can't put it back together again, can you? Yeah. Some things, you know, you you have to let bygones be bygones and move on. So if you can make restitution, if God leads you to make restitution, then do it. Amen. Amen. Ooh. How to react to negativity? How should you react? Stop your ears up. Scream. Y'all like all those suggestions. Okay. Wrong. <laughs> How to react to negativity. James 1.19. The Bible says that every man be swift to hear. In other words, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man works not the righteousness of God. How do you react to negativity? Remember I told you this woman insulted me twice. I don't like your hair. I'm going to teach you how to dress. And I said, well, Pastor Dave likes my hair. And he's cool with the way I dress. It could have been worse. But I passed it up. Right? Amen. Sometimes you have to consider the source. Amen. How many like to would have retaliated? Come on, let me see your hair. <laughs> How to act, react to negativity. I'm, you know, you think I'm just preaching. I do these things. Except with Pastor Dave. I'm getting better at it. Respond with gentleness. Proverbs 15.1. A soft answer turns away wrath. But grievous words or harsh words stirs up anger. Right? How many ain't going to say nothing regardless of what I say? Okay. So, you know what? Sometimes it's not the easiest thing to do. Respond with, a, with gentleness. Proverbs 15, 28. The heart of the righteous studies to answer. In other words, he ponders. He meditates on his answer. Some people, I'm telling you, I think they don't know that they have a filter between their brain and their mouth. They just say whatever they want to say. So in other words, Solomon suggests that we, before we answer, that we need to meditate. Think about what you're going to say before you say it. And if you filter that, how many know you probably won't even say it? There's been times I go, elimination, no, I'm not going to say that. Well, I better not say it like that either. How about I don't say nothing? Yeah, that works sometimes, isn't that right? 
Proverbs 16, 24 says this, pleasant words, so it's a honeycomb, sweet to the mind. And oh, y'all listen, healing to the body. What kind of words? Pleasant words. Or as a honeycomb, sweet to the mind and healing to the body. So in other words, gentle words. Our words can bring healing, can't they? Yes. Our words can defuse what's brooding, you know, like a heated conversation. Isn't that right? Yeah. How to react to negativity. Find a place to agree without compromising. Amen. This may be applicable to a husband and a wife. Ever heard this? Compromise is the key to a healthy relationship. Wrong. Say wrong. You know what? God does not condone compromising his standards, his word. Love them, but don't compromise your biblical convictions. How many know the devil's always after your prayer life? Amen. Mm. Uh, Matthew. 633 says this, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things to be, uh -huh. the word first means proceeding all others in time, order, and importance. Amen. Amen. I used to pray at midnight when everybody is supposed to be asleep. Mm. Here we go with this ex-husband. <laughs> Pastor Jay got me on that. Anyway, my ex-husband would always, he knew I prayed at midnight, right? Because I, I wanted to give God, I thought, okay, I give God the first fruits of my day, so I prayed at midnight. So here he comes. You shouldn't be out here. Come go back to sleep. i never forget as long as I live. I heard God's voice. I was 20 years old. He said, his time is his time, and my time is my time. I elbowed him. Get away from me. I did. He left me alone. He stopped bothering me. You know why? Because he knew I wasn't going to compromise. I'll love you. I'll be nice to you. But I'm not compromising my prayer life, my Bible time, or my relationship with God. It's not going to happen. Amen. And when, when Colton was a little baby, if he cried, I'm telling you, you should have seen me. Here he comes. Here comes Speed Racer. I mean, I was like Speed Racer. That, hear, that, hear that baby cry? Oh, I'm on it. That's different. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about older people. You know what I mean? They want want to take God from me. You can't take God from me. I'm not going to let nobody take God from me because you know why not? One time I was friends with this guy. Just say friends. What's a boyfriend? It's a boy and a friend. Oh, my God. I said, you know what God told me? I can't be friends with you no more. Why not? I say, well, I don't know, but I'm not going to be friends with you anymore. To my son, why not? I say, well, first of all, this is what I said. I say, if I need peace, you certainly can't give it to me. So why would I choose you over God? See, he was making me mad then. Uh -uh. How many know you can't give me joy? You can make me happy, but you, joy is internal joy flows from within joy flows from your relationship with god the joy of the lord is our strength i got him told now didn't i <clears throat> see a little compromise leads to a whole lot of compromise a little leaven leavens a whole lump of dough. You compromising these little things? How to react to negativity? Respond with gentleness. Find a place to agree without compromising. Well, how many know you shouldn't compromise God's standards? No. Amen. I remember, here we go again. It's in my notes. My ex husband. One Saturday, <laughs> Pastor Dave was funny. He didn't hear me. One Saturday, <laughs> okay, that's an inside joke between me and him. One Saturday, I was praying, and um, and then I got ready and I was going to see my mom before I finished praying. The Holy Spirit said, just as clear, he said, when you get to your mom's house, he said, my ex husband, he said his name, he he said, when you he said. You're going to see him today at your mom's house. I went, oh, okay. I ain't think nothing about it. I, I'm telling you, I pulled up my mom's house. I may have been in there five or ten minutes, maybe. Then here comes this unknown car. Just so happens I was standing by the picture window in the living room. And just so happens this unknown car stops almost directly in front of the house. 
And I looked, and here he comes walking out of the, the car. And I went, okay, I hadn't seen him in three years or so. I said, let me get this over. We were separated, then divorced. I said, let me get this over with. And um, I was walking down the steps. He said, hi. I said, hey, how you doing? Mm. And so um, he said, he say, uh, I forgot about this. So now he said, uh, I've seen you a few times. You know, you were downtown and blah, blah, blah. And I thought to myself, I'm glad you didn't come near me. That's what I'm thinking. And he said, um, I want to ask you two questions. I go, what is that? He asked one question. And then he asked number two questions. He says, um, uh, by the way, do you still pray and read like you used to when we were together? I say it's worse. <laughs> I am not lying. You know what he did? He turned around. He didn't say bye. He turned around and walked off. I am not. I mean, boy, get out of my face. You know what I mean? I'm not. You, you know what? How to respond to negativity. And you respond with gentleness, right? You find a place to agree. In other words, you're trying to bring harmony and unity back to your relationship with whomever it is. If it, wait a minute, Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as much as lies within you, live at peace with all men. You've heard me say this over and for years. Some of them, you have to love at a distance. Yeah. There is no peace around them. Love them about 200 miles away, whatever you need. <laughs> I'll love you, spend time with you, but I'm not giving up Jesus for you. Right. I can't hear you. Amen. If you get offended, I sure hate you. I sure hate you offended. But you, if you stop going to church, I'm not gonna stop going to church. Amen. I'm just saying. Say she just saying. Just, just saying. If you hey, listen, I, I like I said, I'm not trading Jesus for nobody's breathing. Nobody. Amen. Period. Nobody. Period. And I'm like this. If I need to be healed, oh, you can't heal me. Amen. I need him. If God is all I have, I have all I need. Amen. Yes, yes, yes. Hallelujah. Wait a minute. You may you may give me some money, but you, you, you're not going to give me as much as God can give me. Come on now. Well, and that's the first commandment. That you have no other gods before him. Love God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Amen. Amen. Okay, next thing we're going to talk about. Say, I forgive me. I forgive me. Oh, that was weak. I forgive me. Oh, she got it. <laughs> Sound like she convinced me. I forgive me too. That's right. God is good, isn't he? Yeah. Whatever has happened in the past, it has passed. Yes, sir. Say amen. amen. You know, how well you forgive yourself is going to depend on how well you forgive other people. Yes, if you're angry with yourself, I'm telling you, there was a time I was angry with myself, and I was angry with everybody else, too. Yeah. And if you're mad with yourself, chances are you're going to snap like a turtle at other people. Yes. I got one yes. That's good. You know, there's only one person that you will be stuck with forever until death you do part. Yes. And then you're stuck even after that. That's you. Say, that's me. that's me. How many know you got to learn how to get along with yourself? You need to understand your flesh. That your flesh didn't get saved when you got saved. Isn't that right? Amen. Paul say, I, I got it. I got to crucify it daily. Self-denial. How do you crucify the flesh? No. That's a good start. Right. Your flesh want to go this way? We're not doing that. Get your flesh by the ear. We are not doing that. Don't hate your flesh. Just learn how it works and deal with it. Amen. Amen. God does not remember past sins. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Sure Psalms 103, verse 12. As far as he says from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. East is east, west is west, and the two never meet. Why would God say that? East is east, west is west. The two never meets. Amen. When God remove our sins, say they're gone. they're gone. They're traveling in the opposite direction from us. Never will you meet up with that sin again. Uh, when, when you appear before God, God is not going to show you that sin. Well, of course he ain't going to show you that sin. You're forgiven because you, should, you sure wouldn't be appearing before him in heaven. Amen. You're forgiven. Amen. Amen. And then the only thing that happens after we die, we go to heaven. God is not going to talk to you about anything right. other than the rewards, what you did for him, what he told you to do while you were on this earth. Yes, 
Because that's when the rewards will be handed out, right? Amen. It's only two people that's going to, no, three people that will remind you of your past sins. The devil. The devil. The devil. People. Other people and yourself. and yourself. Oh, y'all good. That's exactly right. Say, I've been forgiven. I've been forgiven. Colossians 3.13, for bearing one another. In other words, be patient with one another. How many of you got to be patient with your flesh? Oh, yes, you do. How many of you can be flaky? Yeah. Okay, I'll talk about me. Yeah. Fearing one another, forbearing one another. In other words, making allowances for each other's faults. How about your own faults? Yeah. And forgiving one another. That, how many know that includes you? I say that includes you. Amen. Yeah. And if any man have a quarrel against any, that includes yourself. Some people fight with themselves. You stupid, dumb, I can't believe you did that idiotic. Is that a word? I don't know. Idiotic thing. I mean, you know, you're fighting with yourself. The struggle is within. Even as Christ has also forgiven you. So we make allowances for other folks' faults, and we forgive them, those who have offended us. you got to forgive yourself. New Living Translation, remember, the Lord has forgiven you, so you must forgive others and yourself. Say amen. amen. Hebrews 4.15, it says, For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. That word infirmities is not sickness and disease. Uh, the definition there is weaknesses. And then Paul goes on to say, but... He was in all points tempted, like as we are, and yet without sin. So this verse emphatically declares that God, well, we know that Jesus was God. But when he walked on this earth, he didn't operate as God. He operated as a man. He was limited as a man. He's saying, I'm easily touched by the feelings of your weaknesses. He said, I was tempted in all areas as you are, but yet without sin. So it's possible, isn't it? Yes. It's possible not to sin. And he faced every temptation. Say every temptation. You have to forgive yourself. Say amen. amen. Christ's blood. Christ's blood cleanses us daily. Say thank you Jesus. Not once and for all. But say daily. Isn't that right? Only your past sins are cleansed once and for all. I remember after I got saved when I was 15, they go, forgive me of all my sin, blah, blah, blah. And I used to always puzzle me, but what if I forgot one? And some preacher set me free. When you say, God, forgive me of all my sins, you know, at that moment when you come to Christ, all your sins are washed away. Amen. God. And God see your forget Amen. forgetfulness. Amen. Paul declared, there, I forget, Paul said, I forgive myself, and there is therefore no condemnation, no a judge, a judging guilt of wrong, because I'm now in Christ, and I walk not after the flesh, but I walk after the spirit. Righteousness is the ability to stand, whoo, glory, in the presence of God without the sense of guilt, inferiority, and condemnation. Hebrews 10 19 let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need when your heart is free of unforgiveness toward others and yourself you can approach God with assurance and confidence that anything that you ask according to his will you know that he hears you Amen. And he will grant your petition. You know it. Peter, Peter had to forgive. I mean, nothing new under the sun. Freedom. There is, say there's freedom and forgiveness. Freedom. Peter had to forgive himself. Peter was not free. Peter denied Jesus how many times? Oh, remember in the garden, he had a prayer failure. And I mean, in the failure in the garden of Gethsemane. Peter could you not watch with me one hour? That was the one that said, I'll die with you. How many prayer failures have we had? I bet it was more than three. You think? How many, how many times have, has God uh, woke you up or woke me up and, uh, and no, it's just to pray, but we didn't do it. We rolled over and we're back. Everybody raise your hand. We rolled over and we went right back. Oh, I've done it. I mean, no, God forgave. Uh, Peter had to forgive himself. 
He had to. How I many there was a failure right before the crucifixion? What did Peter say? Though all men deny you, I never deny you. Yeah. Remember this damsel. She said, now, weren't you with Jesus of Galilee? He said, woman, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Another maid. This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. I don't even know the man. A bystander. Surely you're one of them. I can tell by your accent. And then he began to swear. Uh, that may mean cuss. We don't know. Probably. I haven't looked that one up. But he could. How many know Peter had to be restored? Peter had to be restored. Jesus forgave and restored Peter. After the resurrection, the angels told the women at the tomb, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen, just like he said. And he, te wait a minute, you tell his disciples, listen to this. He's making a distinction, a, a distinction between the rest of the disciples and Peter that I'll meet him in Galilee. Do you know what that did for Peter's heart? That got him out of the valley of despair, out of the valley of unforgiveness and discouragement. He leaped up. Praise God. God is good, isn't he? Yes. It was music to St. Peter's ears. Tell my disciples. The ain't, and the women said, he said, tell his disciples, all y'all. He said, and you, Peter. You know what that did for Peter? Yeah. Jesus forgave him and Jesus restored him. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paul forgave himself. Paul was a trip. And you talking about, a, um, what do they call him, a rap sheet? Is that what you call it? Ooh, ooh. What did he do? He persecuted the followers of Christ. He imprisoned some of them and had some of them put to death. He was the instigator at Stephen's death. Ooh. Boy, that's kind of deep, isn't it? Yeah, then he had the nerve to say this. Receive us. We've wronged no man. I remember, I don't know, I guess I was about 26, 27, I don't know. And I said something to somebody. Oh, I couldn't believe I said it. It was absolutely insane. I still can't believe I did it. I'm over it now. I forgave myself. And um, I couldn't go to prayer, folks. I mean, weighing down with condemnation and guilt, embarrassing. I'm like, oh, God, I can't believe I did that. And that was my prayer life. That right there. The whole three, four hours, that's, it was that. Wow. One time I walked in my prayer room, shut the door. I heard an audible voice. St um, Stretch forth your hands. I went, <laughs> and say what Paul said. I've wronged no man. Woo. And I was set free. And you know my story. I told some guy. I said, I think you're my husband. I think we're supposed to get married. I thought that was unpardonable saying that was the craziest thing I think I ever. I mean, that was insane. To me, it was. I couldn't. I, it was hard for me. And this went on for a while. And when I heard that audible voice, I go, okay, I've wronged no man. And I was set free. Praise God. Amen. Yes, and then, you know, I went around telling everybody what I did. Not. <laughs> God is a good God. Amen. Yeah. Unforgiveness towards self and others, it steals your confidence. I had no confidence to boldly approach the throne of grace after doing that. Yeah. Philippians 3 14. Paul said, One thing I must do, forgetting those things which are behind. Say, I'm going to forgive myself. Forgive myself. Amen. Amen. Paul not only forgave himself, but he forgot about it. He said, forgetting those things which are behind. And I have to see, you know how, you know how he could forget? Because he pressed toward God. You got to press toward God. Forget about shoulda, coulda, woulda, what you did and all that. Just move on. Amen. Amen. I don't know why I feel like I'm going to bring this up again. You remember last service, I said this. I say some things you should never forget. It all depends on the offense. Somebody has physically harmed you or harmed your children or whatever. You don't want to give yourself, put yourself in a compromised situation, right. and you don't want to give them access to your little dumpling. That's, right. that's to me, that's common sense. Amen. But you'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. <laughs> now, as ridiculous as this may sound, it happens all the time. Forgive God. 
You ever said this? I hate I was ever born God. Y'all probably never said it. I did. Well, some of you. Have you ever said this? Certain people saying, I hate, I wish I was a different color, a different nationality, a different race. I've said that before, too. I got over that. Hmm. I wish I had different parents. How many has ever said that? Y'all ain't going to admit to none. I did too. I told God, I said, now look here. You say I'm calling to preach the gospel. Why would you put me in a family? For years, nobody was saved. Oh. I went, I don't understand you. And I'm, I'm looking at all these, these preachers, these kids, these preachers' kids. They come from a long line of preachers. The daddy was a preacher. The grandmama was. I'm like, what? I said, why would you put me in a family? And ain't nobody saved but me, God. Why would you give me a family like that? I wasn't expecting this. Holy Spirit said, I didn't give them to you. I gave you to them for their salvation. And I'm telling you, that has showed up big. I have two brothers that would be in H-E-L double two picks if I hadn't prayed them out. That's a true story. And I mean, when, anyway, God is good, isn't it? I mean, the list goes on. God, you kill my baby. People get People, you have to forgive God. You know why? That's going to steal your confidence too. How can, you, how can you go boldly to the throne of grace and ask God for something when you have ought against him? Should bother your conscience, shouldn't it? Yeah. It, bother, it might bother your mind. How many know nearly everything bad that happens is God's fault? How about insurance companies? They blame God for uh, some things that they should pay for. They call them acts of God. <laughs> okay, why am, I, why am I insured then? Okay. Only God knows, isn't that right? We blame God for everything. How, is there anybody that's going to blame the devil? Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I came to give you life to the full until it overflows. Man. So if there's any stealing, killing, and destroying... No, you're no the enemy. Say it's the devil. Now, this is you don't have to raise your hands on this. Is anybody gonna blame themselves for getting yourself in that mess you got yourself in? Yeah. Yeah, I got I got two of you. Yeah, me too. Amen. How many how many know you can open the door for stuff and then you get mad at God? Why why you let this happen? No, you open the door for that junk. Things that cause offense toward God. Uh -oh. How about failure or your plans? Proverbs 19.3. A foolish, the foolishness of man. Foolishness of man perverts his way and his heart frets against the Lord. In other words, when our plans don't work out, we blame God. Nobody's ever done that. Okay. I probably could hear a pen drop. That's okay. Lord, I'm going to do this, and now I want you to bless it. Hebrews 12, 2. I'm the author and the finisher of your faith. Joyce Myers said it like this. If God didn't author that, he's not obligated to finish that. This one preacher, make your plan so big that without God, you'll fail. Look at your neighbor say, exactly you will. Make your plan so big that without God, you'll fail. I understood what he was trying to convey, but I thought, uh-uh. I'm not, I, yeah, I want to make sure it's God before I make my plans. How many of you tired of failing? You want to make sure it's a God idea and not just a good idea. Things that cause offense toward God. How about doing your own thing? The foolish of man perverts his way. Doing your own thing, then you ask God to bless it. Jesus prayed, uh, not my will, but your will be done. And the Lord's, the Lord's prayer is a model prayer in Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11, where he said this, Jesus said, pray this way. They said, teach us how to pray. And he said, pray this way, thou kingdom come, thou will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Man perverts his way. In other words, he does his own thing, he runs his life, uh, then it's God's fault. Job, after he lost his health, he opened his mouth and he cursed the day he was born. But he also opened his mouth and he told us why he experienced so much calamity too. Job 325, 
Oh, he said, the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. So he feared losing his children, his wealth, and his health. Lady walked up to me, happened more than once. At the end of the service, almost everybody was gone. She said, Pastor Pam, I need for you to pray for me. I go, sure, what is it? Almost everybody was gone. I said, sure, what is it? She said, I went to the doctor, and my mammogram is something wrong, and, and I don't know what it is. And she said, I'm scared to death, and I'm going to have cancer. My mama died with it, and my grandmama died with it. I said, and you are not going to die with it. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ has redeemed you from the curse of the law. I said, you are not. We bind that. Anyway, short of it is, she went there. It was nothing. The devil was trying to. See, see, the battlefield. Joyce Meyer has his book out, The Battlefield of the Mind. If he can get you to think in a certain way, he got you. That's why the Bible says Second Corinthians 10, 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, bringing in captivity every thought into the obedience of Christ. The devil give you a thought, oh, you know, so-and-so died with this, you're going to have it. I bind you in Jesus' name. By his stripes, I am healed. What they had don't have anything to do with you. If you let God start it, then he's obligated to finish it. Things that cause offense towards God. How about lack of patience? The Clark sisters. He may not come when you want him, but he's right on time. Now, why he shows up 1159, I don't know. When you find out, let me know. But you have to. And I think he's actually teaching us faith. Yeah. Amen. You know, the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering. Say patience. patience yes. We need to develop the fruit of patience. How about the children of Israel? They thought God wasn't moving fast enough. They got the belly aching. They got the murmuring. They got the complaining. Huh. God brought us in the wilderness to kill us. Now, he could have done that when he parted the Red Sea, couldn't he? He could have, he said, Moses, I'm tired of them. Stretch your rod over the sea. They're all, they're all in the middle. Stretch it over the sea and let's, let's kill them right now. That is crazy. Isn't it? Think about that. He could have killed them before they entered the wilderness. No, I did not get that from Pastor Dave. That's just come to me. I mean, he could have killed them. Isn't that right? That makes no sense. You think about that. Whoa, wow. God did not bring me and Pastor Dave in this ministry this far to leave us. If God, wait a minute. If God wanted us to shut it down, couldn't he have done it many, many years ago? Now, I want you to think about that. Uh, I mean, God is not going to desert us. Uh -uh, he always show up and show out. He's always going to use somebody. He always have a ram in the thicket. Thank you, Jesus. God is good. Amen. Wait a minute. And God did not bring me personally this far to kill me. If I don't preach the gospel, I, I will. You know, it's over. I do know that. But I'm just saying he didn't bring me this far to kill me. He healed me of tuberculosis for a reason. So I can preach the gospel. I will preach the gospel until I take my last breath. Or the rapture comes. God did not bring them in the wilderness to kill them. He brought them out of Egypt to uh, help them enter the promised land. He wanted to take them to the promised land. But what should have been, they got the murmuring and belly aching. The wilderness was supposed to be an 11-day pit stop. But their mouths turned it into 40 years. How long are you going to stay in the wilderness? 11 days or 40 years? It's up to us, isn't it? Say, my breakthrough is coming. And you got to remember, this is what they said in Exodus 16, 3. If only we had died in the wilderness or stayed in Egypt. The Bible say they were making hot bricks in over 100 degree weather. Now, they, they saw their parents do it. They saw their grandparents, their great grandparents, because uh, they were enslaved for 430 years, one generation after another generation. And they go, uh, with the God, we died in the wilderness or stayed in Egypt, where we sat around the flesh pots and we ate all the fried chicken and watermelon we wanted. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh -huh. They were in bondage. And remember what God told Moses? I have come down to deliver them. They cried out by reason of their affliction. They forgot they were crying out, God help us, God help us, God help us, God. And God told them, he said, you tell them, I have come down to deliver them. I'm telling you, don't murmur and complain. Whatever you're going through, just know you're going to go through it on the other side. Remember Jesus told the disciples, uh, let us go over to the other side. Look at your neighbor and say, you're going to the other side. Say, I'm going with him. In Jesus' name. The children of Israel got offended uh, <laughs> at the manna. They didn't like the, di the diet that God put them on. We're tired of this junk. We want meat. Uh, how did that turn out for them? The Bible says that quail flew in the camp, covered the camp, and they got me. God said, let me tell you about, you know what he was trying to do? He was trying to discipline the flesh. Any, any abstinence of food or certain things, you're disciplining your flesh. You're saying no to your flesh. God wanted to have them on a bread diet. They didn't like that bread diet? Uh-uh. So quail flew in the camp. And he say, I know you, your flesh going to get out of control. You're going to eat so much, you're going to vomit it up. It's going to come out of your nostril. It happened just like that. I'm telling you, if they had stayed with that manner, I just had a thought. If they had stayed with that diet, you, you, you get it? God was trying to discipline their flesh. They probably would have made it to the other side. That flesh was out of control. Moses up on the mountain, 40 days, 40 nights, went to Aaron. We don't know what has become. We don't have a leader. What has become of his fellow Moses? Aaron, okay, let's make you a leader. How did that turn out for him? Thousands of them died in one day. The flesh is totally out of control. If it's out of control, one way to get it in control is fast. That could be TV. Social media accounts, oh, I'm messing with y'all too now. Allowing discouragement to set in. Remember John the Baptist was in prison? You remember that? He sent two of his disciples to Jesus. Are you the Christ or should we look for another? Ooh. Now previously... He had full confidence that Jesus was the Messiah. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. I'm the one that's preparing the way for the Messiah. Now he, he said all that. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. I indeed baptize you with water for the remission of sins. But there is one who is coming after me. He is greater than me. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Amen. That's what he was preaching. Before he, he allowed discouragement to set in. And then in John 1, 19, the next day, John saw Jesus coming. He's getting ready to fulfill prophecy. Behold, this is what John said. Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And in verse 32, John testified this. I saw the Holy Spirit descending upon him like a dove from heaven and it rested upon him. And the heavens opened. And I heard a voice say, This is my beloved son, and whom I am well pleased. What happened? He allowed discouragement to set in. He got offended at God. He got offended at Jesus. Now, are you the one, or should I look for another? Don't let the devil steal your testimony. Don't let murmuring and complaining steal your blessing. The difference between John's attitude here concerning Christ and before he went to prison. How did John get offended? He was thrown in jail and he allowed discouragement to set in. Now, on the other hand, Paul and Silas, they were beaten, flogged, beaten, thrown in jail. They could have allowed discouragement to set in, but the Bible says at midnight, they were shackled in chains. At midnight, they began to sing and praise God. And what happened? What happened? The foundation of the prison doors were shaken, kind of like an earthquake. And everyone's chains were loose. 
Don't murmur, don't complain, and God will set you free. Amen? What causes offense toward God? We're almost done. Not following your own heart. You remember Eve disobeyed God, and then she talked to Adam. All scholars agree that Adam was right there when Eve had that conversation with the devil. Because the Bible says the devil talked her into doing it. She partook of the apple. She bit it. And the Bible says she gave some to her husband. It doesn't say, hey, Adam, come here. I got something to say to you. He was right there. Ooh. God asked Adam, what have you done? Why did you disobey me? It's the woman you gave me. In other words, if you hadn't given me this check, none of this never would have happened. <laughs> right? What causes offense toward God? How about listening to other people? Yeah. Me, Christians. They mean well, right? You listen to other people. Why did you put them in my life? Yeah, right. Uh -huh. Then you blame them or God. Shifting the blame. How many know that's not taking responsibility for your own actions? The blame game is as old as Adam. It didn't work for Adam and it's not working for us. Say amen. amen. Uh, following your plans, purposes, and pursuits. How many they always lead to failure? Y'all ain't going to say none. Okay. God told Jonah, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against the wickedness, for it has come up before me. Uh, make your plans so big that without God you'll fail. Jonah had big plans. He thought he got on this ship. He thought he was going to go somewhere else and live a good life. How did that turn out for him? Uh -uh. That wasn't God's plan. That failed, didn't it? Following your own plans, purpose, and pursuits, it always leads to failure. Always leads or ends in frustration. You see, you keep saying you're almost done. I am. God desires to be friends with his children. 2 Corinthians 5, 19. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. We are beseeching for Christ's sake, be reconciled to God. The word reconcile simply means to become God's friend. All you have to do, forgive God. And you're his friend again. Amen. Stand with me. In closing. This is my fifth closing. Luke 17, 1. Then Jesus said to his disciples, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. What does that mean? Offenses are unavoidable. They will come. You're going to have many opportunities to be offended. But how we respond to that offense will determine how fast we grow and mature. Amen. Say altitude determines no attitude determines altitude offense will stunt your growth you don't want that to happen amen amen well that's all the time we have for this broadcast if this message was a blessing to you don't forget to like subscribe share this video and for more information about glory church st louis go to our website at glory church st louis for more information about our services until then this is pastor pam rock reminding you that god really does love you and keep the switch of faith turned on because god has a plan for your life amen